Welcome to this lecture in inverse problems. And today we will start by discussing a result that we achieved at the end of the last lecture. And that was the representation of... And that was the representation of least square solutions and minimum norm solutions in terms of the singular value decomposition. And uh, I have already formulated this as corollary 3.34. So assume K is a compact operator from X to Y, X and Y Hilbert spaces. Um, assume that sigma K, UK, VK defines a singular system for K. Uh, then we find that the least square solution of K of the uh, inverse problem K U equals G are given by sum over all K, one over sigma K, scalar product of G and VK times UK plus an element U perp, which is arbitrary in the null space of K. And the minimum norm solution is achieved by setting that u perp equal to zero. Now, um, one remark, of course, that has to exist. The sum must exist, and that's not guaranteed because uh, uh, the one over sigma k are now getting large. They're not limited in the case of an infinite singular system. Remember, if uh, the singular system is infinite, then the sigma k accumulate at zero, they converge to zero, and uh, that means the one over sigma k converge to infinity, and so there is no upper bound on the one over sigma k. Um, the proof more or less was, was extremely simple. Uh, we just used the normal equation for least squares. So that's k star k u is equal to k star g and plugged in the singular value decomposition. And then by just comparing coefficients, you get the, uh, the first uh, equation, the representation of the least square solutions. And uh, well, the second one is, uh, um, obtained by observing that the minimum norm solution must be in the range of k star. Now we already uh, proved uh, uh, that uh, the minimum uh, that the least square solution only exists if the right hand side, so that's our g, is in fact in the kernel, is in the range of k plus the range of k perp, which is the same as the null space of k adjoint. So uh, let's just check that uh, this is correct. So assume that g can be represented uh, as an element in the range of k plus the range of k perp, which is nothing but the null space of k adjoint, uh, which means that g can be written as, uh, let's say, k times x plus some element v. OK, uh, now let's look at the scalar product of g and vk. This is nothing but kx plus v. Uh, with a uh, scalar product with vk. Now, this is the same as x times k adjoint vk plus the scalar product of v and vk. And now, uh, since v is in the range of k perp or in the kernel of k adjoint, we definitely have k, k adjoint v is zero, which means that v is an eigen uh, function of k uh, of k um, of k k adjoint uh, to, for the eigenvalue zero, and that means uh, that v and v k are, um, are eigenvectors of the same operator for of the same self adjoint operator for different eigenvalues, which means that they're orthogonal. And so that's zero. 
Now, k star vk from our definition, that was nothing but x and sigma k times vk. And plugging this in, that means while well, you see what happens, the sigma k goes away. And in this case, the minimum norm solution, let me write down the minimum norm solution because it's just there, is given by sum overall k. The sigma k goes away, scalar product on x of x and vk times, uh, of, excuse me, uh, uk. The k star is, no, this is a uk. Yeah, we had proved k star vk is sigma k times uk. And so um, this is nothing but uh, in, uh, due to Bessel's inequality, uh, we have that sum over x and uk uh, squared is uh, summable, is uh, small, smaller than infinity, so this converges. And this means that there is a least square solution and also a minimum norm solution. Okay, the, uh, so the, um, the formula is fine where we expect it to be. So if G is in the correct range. Now let's look at the formula at the Green formula for the minimum norm solution with respect to error amplification. And now you realize that things are now exactly the other way around. When we looked at the application of an operator, we noticed that uh, for small, for the uh, for uh, UK with K small, uh, we had a large error amplification. That, that was the, the error amplification was sigma K. So, and for the um, UK with large, um, with large K, the sigma K was very small. So then we had a very small error amplification. Now, of course, due to the one over sigma k, things are now completely different. If we look at the green formula, then uh, we find when k is small, then one over sigma k uh, is relatively small. And uh, so there will be a moderate uh, error amplification. But if k is large and the singular system is infinite, then one over sigma k will be arbitrarily large. So the error amplification with respect to the uk for k large will be very large. Okay, so uh, we are left with the insight that uh, in this sum, some of the terms can be computed quite nicely because they have only a small error amplification. And some are very bad. And uh, those are these with the big error amplification. So when sigma k is small or when k is large. Which you, we'll uh, look at an example for that. Uh, but we already realize um, the faster the sigma k go to zero, the more difficult it will be to solve the inverse problem because if the uh, sigma, sigma k tend to zero very uh, very fast then only some of the terms that we're summing up will be will have a moderate um, error amplification and uh, all the others will be completely garbage okay so this gives rise to the following definition degree of ill postness uh, let me check what it is we have uh, I always forget the number 3.35. So that's definition. Three point three five, and that's degree of ill postness. And uh, um, an inverse problem for a compact operator K mildly in post of order N if there is a C of, of order, let's call this of order uh, alpha. If there exists a C 
such that um, sigma n is smaller or equal to c times 1 over n to the alpha for all n. So that means nothing but sigma n is of the order 1 over n. And it's severely ill-posed. or ill post with infinite order. If no, n c with that property exist. And now you will say, oh, my, uh, wait a minute. Degree of ill postness, we already had that, right? That, that was something uh, about uh, the, de the derivatives, um, inverse problem of integration. Uh, and we already defined the um, inverse problem of, um, um, of integration. So first, um, taking the first derivative to be of order one, taking the second derivative of order two, and so on. So. Uh, what, where's the difference? Well, if you look at this, uh, then it's exactly the same because uh, we already proved for our example that, uh, the, uh, um, that the singular values of the differentiation um, decay like uh, 1 over n, or, excuse me, of the inverse problem of integration. Uh, the, for the integration, they decay like 1 over n. So that's exactly the same here, right? I mean, uh, so both definitions give you the same, um, uh, give you the same, um, de same degree of ill postness, but I like the other one better because uh, it was the original one that was defined by Hadamard. And now it also becomes clear what I meant at the beginning by saying that the radon transform has uh, uh, the uh, degree of ill-posedness of one half. It just means that uh, the singular values of the radon transform decay like one over square root of n. Finally, before we get to an example, um, let me define 3.36. And this is a generalized inverse or more Penrose inverse and uh, well let uh, K operator from x to y and we will also we'll only look at Hilbert spaces and then uh, the operator k plus that goes from the range of k plus the kernel of k adjoint to x, and which is defined by k plus g as, uh, oops, excuse me, to um, k plus g is uh, u plus, u plus the minimum norm solution of k u equals g is called generalized inverse.
Now, obviously, this is well defined because we already know that uh, the generalized in the, the minimum norm solution exists exactly if G is in the range of K plus the kernel of K adjoint or range of K perp. Okay, so uh, this is well defined and we make use of that. And uh, now let's look at a small numerical experiment. For this small numerical test, I've uh, set up a program uh, that uh, implements the minimum norm solution for the problem uh, that, we, that we use to compute the singular values and singular functions. So the inverse problem of integration on the, um, um, on the unit interval. And uh, I will implement this formula and I will do that discreetly. So this is not in fact an infinite system that I'm using, but a finite system. But anyway, the one over sigma k, a good approximation of the sigma k's that we, uh, that we already computed. So we expect them to be relatively small in uh, for large k and we'll see what the effect of that is. Okay, so I did this in MATLAB, so let's run it. Okay, and right. now you're seeing already. Okay, okay, let me start with this. So, uh, on the right hand side, um, I hope you see. Yes, you see my mouse pointer. Yes. Um, on the right hand side is, is the function. So the function I'm looking at is a um, step function that is one on the interval from zero to 0 0.5 and which is zero on the interval from 0 0.5 to one. Um, you notice that uh, I chose this, um, th that there's a reason why I'm choosing this um, because uh, if you look at it, at it very closely, then this is exactly in the range of uh, the operator because the uh, first derivative is zero at one and it, derive, it arrives at zero. Um, and it, it's uh, the first derivative is uh, zero at zero and uh, the value is zero at one. So uh, you find uh, that's exactly the kind of solutions of the uh, ordering differential equations that we derived for the range. Okay, so uh, this is now fine. Uh, what is the data that we get? So data is uh, the integration of this function. So it's x in this range over here, and uh, then it stays because then the function is zero. So the data that we have is the one that we have here. So it becomes bigger first, and then you form over here, it, uh, it just doesn't change. Um, Maybe you don't see it, but uh, actually this, uh, the data is here twice. I have once the correct function, the correct measurements without any error. And uh, once I have uh, added an error of about, I think about one to the minus three or one to the minus four. So, so that's a very small error. And uh, you can't even see that the two data sets which I will be using are different, but they are. Okay, so uh, now let's look at the reconstruction from error-free data. So um, I have used my data. Now I'm uh, computing the minimum norm solution and it gives me back the original function. Um, you can't even see that there's any difference, right? And you must believe me that the original and the reconstruction are plotted over each other. Why is that absolutely error-free? Well, what I'm doing here is more or less, I'm first applying uh, the matrix, I'm first applying the operator, then I'm applying the inverse operator. So what should go wrong, right? I mean, uh, you're getting back the original function and that's what we see here. Um, now, when I go to the noisy data, what happens now? Okay, so now this is the reconstruction from noisy data. That looks terrible, absolutely terrible. Um, why is that, first of all? Well, just go back to our formula. 
I mean, now we have some noise. So the scalar product that we have here has not been computed exactly. So there is some, there is some small noise in there. However, multiplying that with one over sigma k, we get a very large noise in the result. So if k is large or sigma k is small, then this will be this uh, this term will be will uh, will have a large error amplification and will be hard to compute. Okay, and this is exactly what we see here, right? Um, I thought I could get everything back. Ah, yeah, there it is. Uh, this is what we see here. There are some, some of the terms are just terrible and uh, um, the error amplification is large, so we have a large error. Okay, but that's, we could say, okay, that's it, right? We can't do anything about it, but there is one thing we can do. If you look very, very closely, then you find that the structure of the old function is somehow still in here. Although it looks terrible, if you look, and, and this, this part over here, of this very noisy function is definitely higher than the one over here. So somehow, although there is all that noise, uh, uh, there's all that noise there, um, the structure of the old function is somehow still in there, just overlaid by all that noise that we see over here. Okay, what could be one remedy? Well, let's go back to our formula again. Now we know that some of these terms are good, some of these terms are bad. Okay, so the easiest thing we can do is throw the bad terms out. And honestly, that's really more or less everything that's behind the treatment of inverse problem of the mathematical treatment in inverse problems. You're just getting rid of the bad terms in this sum and throw them away or at least make them small and that's it. Okay, so um, let's do that here. And let's do this for exactly the same data I had before. But this time I restricted the sum to all those terms uh, that were well, uh, that were well computable. So where the noise amplification was small and you see, well, we, I'm not getting back the original of course, because I'm not using the complete sum, right? I mean, there's something missing here, but um, Nevertheless, I mean, this looks much, much better than this one over here. So um, this might be a good idea to actually do this. And uh, so in, uh, uh, in the next uh, chapter, we will look at strategies of reducing that noise without completely destroying our images or as here, our functions.